Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to get into the last match of day one here at Singapore as Cloud9 will be taking on Kaboom Esports. Earlier today, Kaboom lost to Najin White Shield by being strategically outplayed uh, across the map. And just two games ago, Cloud9 took down Alliance by outplaying them strategically. Proly, high outplayed Froggen in that matchup. For sure. 99 CS at 10 minutes. It is as near to perfect as you can get. Uh, talk to me about the play, talk to me about Hyde and Cloud9 and you know how they're looking in their first game. I think a lot of teams are kind of undervaluing Syndra and not really understanding what she brings. And Hai, that's the just perfect champion for Hai. Has super early game potential and a lot of potential to stand up on its own two legs. So Hai was able to push his advantage without any jungle pressure. And if you watch throughout that game, he's taking Race and Wolves whenever he wants. And on the other side, Froggen can't take jungle camps when he wants because if he leaves, Syndra will be back in that lane, shoving to the turret. Yeah, Kaboom on the other side. They put up a, a decent showing against Najin Shield. I don't think they were absolutely smashed in the laning phase, which is quite positive. Freak, I know you're talking quite highly of the Brazilian scene in this squad. Yeah. Do you think they're going to put up a better fight against Cloud9? So I think Kaboom is going to be somewhat like AHQ was back in group stage one, where honestly, they're better than people think. Um, so, okay, Dark Pass didn't do very well. Brazil, I think, is ahead of the curve there. I think the top Brazilian teams could actually qualify for, like, the North American LCS, for example. Um, probably. Careful, Tinone's coming for you. Um, <laughs> but, but, but honestly, like... Uh, it's an underrated region. There's actually a lot of good players there. I talked about it in the previous show. They're a region that's been importing some players, and yet Kaboom was able to beat out the teams that had imported some sort of B tier Korean. So uh, they are a team that I think can pull out a couple of wins. We'll see. I think they're worth talking about, uh, but they are, of course, an underdog. Cloud9 is just one of the most consistent teams in North American history. I mean, you don't. You're, Cloud9 is synonymous with just being top tier NA. They are like the cornerstone of North American talent. So. It'd be really surprising for me if Kaboom even won one lane. Probably final thought before we move on. I do want to ask Freak, since you're a big Kaboomer. Yeah. Who's <laughs> the star of Kaboom? Honestly, to me, it's Tenones. Um, he is a very good mid later. He's actually a player who's going to pull bands. His Orianna, I want to see it come out here. He's been very good with it. And he sort of was one of the big factors that carried them in the wildcard qualifier. So but two things, guy. two things. Number one, analysts are not queuing their own replays. Number two, analysts are not asking their own questions. Yeah. <laughs> Screw it, I'll do some analysis. He's <laughs> ten maybe, maybe undefeated in Oriana yep. from their regional playoffs as well as international wildcard. Mm -hmm. And how many games? Oh yeah, 7-0. <laughs> oh, I need to oh, correct myself, right. by the way. He's coming well, for all Let's job. roll this on. bottom <laughs> girls, yes. Earlier today, ooh, <laughs> earlier today, <laughs> guys, hashtag Kaboom Wim was actually trending on Twitter worldwide. So they might be the underdogs in this game, but they've got a massive amount of support from their fans back in Brazil. We'll see if they've learned some from that previous game. We're going to throw over to the casters, but before that, let's hear how Cloud9's high has been burning things up in the Korean solo queue. I'm excited to play. It's been about like a month since we've done something competitive. We've been practicing in Korea for the last three weeks, and I'm just excited to play now. I've been doing well in the Korean solo queue. Just the games went really well for me. I have kind of hit a peak for the moment. I just won like 10 straight games. The early matches uh, mattered a lot because it determines your MMR. And since he won like 10 straight games, his MMR became really high compared to me. So rank is a middle line. He's playing a lot of the roles. So he was taking support, he was taking mid, he was taking AD. He wasn't like only playing his mid lane role. Being selfless and shot card helped him win a lot of solo queue games. I feel like playing a lot of solo queue, which me and him did, uh, will strengthen us as players and can only be positive. I was kind of expecting a mid laner to make it first, like Bjergsen or Froggen, but High kind of surprised me because he wasn't like the guy to look out for to make it first. So him making it first was really impressive actually. It always means something if you just get to the top and you like to stay there for a while. So he was like the only guy getting challenged there. Korean solo queue fits him very well. I don't necessarily think my challenger solo queue games will help that much for performance, but it helps more than it hurts. Pai has been working super hard and doing well in solo queue, and it has translated into our scrims. Like he, he's been doing really well in almost all the games. So I, I think Hai will have a really big impact in Worlds for us this year. 
Well, we'll see if High's performance in Korean solo queue will help to carry his team. So far, we could say yeah. so good for Cloud9 and High. We're going to check out the starting lineups, though, for this game. On the blue side, it's Cloud9 from North America, with, of course, Balls in the top lane, Meteors in the jungle, High in the mid lane, Sneaky on AD carry, and Lemon Nation on support. And on the red side, it's Brazil's Kaboom Esports. In the top lane, it's Lep. In the jungle is Danagorn. Mid lane, it's Tinones. At 80 carry, Minerva. And the support is Dan's. Yeah, and we really just saw the momentum that Cloud9 is probably going to have in their game against Alliance. However, Kaboom did have to play what is most likely the most difficult team in the group. They had to play Najin Shield. It wasn't necessarily pretty. I believe they got one kill in the whole set of shenanigans there. They're obviously the underdog, as the analyst desk was saying. But how much of an underdog? Because Freak yeah. seemed quite confident in the fact that they could be the, the AHQ type team that we saw from groups A and B last week in Taipei. They themselves managed to take a win off EDG right in the very last moment and force that tiebreaker match. Can Kaboom do it in this group, though? I mean, I cast the international wild card in Seattle with Freak, and they were definitely really dominant in that one against the Latin American team. So I'm not sure, because it's all about these teams that are amazing, but it's all about relative power. A team like Dark Passage was completely undefeated yep. in their region and yep. then was completely steamrolled on the world stage. And like Doublelift was saying, Cloud9 is the pinnacle of North American excellence. So it's not like they're just going to play a North American team. They're going to play Cloud9. Well, if they're going to focus on anything, it would definitely be getting their Minerva going. Get that AD carry spot in a strong position for them. Dan's the shot caller. We'll see him making quite a bit of calls throughout the game. But the picks in bands. We'll see what Lemon Nation can do with these for Cloud9. We already see the Kale. With Maokai and Kha'Zix coming out to stop Danagorn. And that top lane left. So, first three bands then already in from Kaboom and Zed I feel a good choice to get rid of. We do see though that Meteor's gonna have first pick coming his way. They actually take Lee Sin, they banned out Kha'Zix themselves of course which was a champion that Meteor's ran that last time around. Poppy and Nah playing the crowd a bit. <laughs> Not sure about that one. <laughs> As they double lock in and everyone explodes but no. Uh, I think the Lee Sin first pick is just to try and diminish the playmaking potential from Danagorn. Cloud9 feels like the only way they lose this game is if Kaboom can successfully pick a bunch of playmakers and then basically, there's a word for this, complete on a bunch of really high risk plays, convert a bunch of really high risk plays. Danagorn looking to lock in that Vi. We did see that come in the regionals for him. That's a pretty sufficient ganks pre six for getting that ultimate in. He is a very aggressive jungler. Looks like they'll actually leave that one away since they see the Lin Lee Sin already. Take the Thresh and Lucian for the Wife Steel lane. Yeah, I think they'll be happy with that for the first couple of picks. Get themselves onto something comfortable here. It's no secret that Minerva is going to be a big part of getting this team going. We'll see how Kaboom can translate from these picks into the game itself. For Cloud9 then, Jungler already locked in here for Meteos. And what are they actually going to add into this one? Of course, Zed taken away from High. I'll see if he actually goes for something for that mid lane in the second round of choices with a couple of different options being taken off the table. At this point, there's still a hell of a lot open for him. Yeah, I almost feel, Joe, like something has fundamentally changed with Cloud9's pick and ban phase because this is now two games in a row here at Worlds where they're waiting until near the end of the clock. Obviously, the double lock-in is the smart thing to do never lock in one champion and then wait on the next because it will give the other team more time to right. prepare for your pick. But they're just doing a lot more discussion than they previously would. It used to be everything just shoots back and forth really quickly. They're still getting strong and powerful picks, but they're much more sure or cautious about it here at Worlds than they were in NALCS. Definitely putting a little twist on the thought process Kaboom has to choose each champion. They just see it and then they are forced to answer what they have going. Obviously, they do want to create something that will be able to stop Cloud9 and whatever the composition they're putting together, but is it safer for them to kind of just play what they know how to play and kind of go straight down the line with their comfort? I feel like Kaboom are going to have to take some calculated risks to pull off upsets in this group. Yep. I mean, they, I think, themselves have yep. got not too much to lose. Of course, the massive Brazilian fan base that they have 
stood behind them. So, you know, pulling out a win here against any of these teams will be a massive deal for them. They decide in their second round to lock in Jarvan for the jungle there for Danagon, and of course taking Lulu as well. As an example, AHQ picked Blitzcrank multiple times in their group back in Taiwan mainly because of the playmaking potential. It never paid off for them, but it was still their attempt in swinging team fights in their favor. Thresh is a similar style playmaker. I'm expecting Tanones maybe to just play Orianna, honestly, because he will be able to make plays on that. Cloud9, though, picking their tribe tree. Yeah, the Janna goes in for support. You see Dan's taking that Thresh. Didn't see it at the International Wildcard Tournament, but they will throw it in for this composition. And I gets the Yasuo. We we're saying, or I think it was Crepo saying, or no, probably. Something he can stand on his own two feet, as well as carry the game if necessary. So again, he locks in that champion and an all-around huge scaling team into the late game here for Cloud9. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of scaling again. The Janna for the safe disengage. That will come in so handy against Jarvan. And I really wonder what Janones is going to pick against High here. As Freak was saying, he would be the star for this team if one is to emerge. That Oriana is up. Let's see if that is the choice for them. There's a lot of discussion going on there. Back and forth with Kaboom, and he will end up playing the Syndra. So Tinone's got to come out big here. I mean, it's a calculated risk in the sense that they don't want to lose lanes. They need to try and control them here. Cinder is a stronger laner than Oriana against Yasuo. We've already seen today Xiaowei Xiao, Syndra come out on top of Cool's Yasuo. So it's a matchup that can. Yep tilt a little in Cinder's favor. It's a skill matchup, though, with all things considered, but I do not disagree with that pick from Tinotes. Medios on his Lee Sin, ready to create aggression, as well as Danagorn. Somebody, as we said, likes to really just get in the face of his opponents. I believe this is going to be quite an aggressive game here. This Kaboom watching Cloud9 play a little bit safe in their early game. I think they may try to take it to him. Yeah, and that's a somewhat of a, I don't know if you can really call it an advantage because called Cloud9 will have seen Kaboom play earlier on yeah. as well, but taking those risks, try and set up something a little bit different, something a little bit, you know, uh, surprising from cloud Nine side of things and try and just throw them off a, you know, a, a strong paced early game, which will, of course, play into Kaboom's hands. The question is whether they can translate, even if they pull off something amazing at the start of the game, whether they can actually follow that through and turn that big play early on into a win. That's a difficult thing against these teams that have so much experience. So much of it will have to be with Danagorn's jungle Jarvan and basically Meteos' ability to neutralize him in the early game. Meteos is coming from a place where he has so much trust in his lanes that the only way they really lose is if Danagorn swings them, so he basically just has to turn himself on to shutting that down. So guys, don't forget that you can vote on Twitter who you think is going to win this game. Tweet hashtag C9win or hashtag KBMwin to at LOL Esports and we'll check out your vote shortly. But for now, we are going to get into game. It's Cloud9 versus Kaboom. And can Kaboom pull off an upset here against Cloud9? It'd be a massive one at this stage. A massive one indeed. The champion selected Lemonation was able to come up with for the team is very scary. Like we said, that's scaling into the late game, so Cloud9 can pretty much play any game they want with this one. <laughs> and while I said there's nothing for Kaboom to lose in this one, which I really think is true from cloud Nine side, this is the win on paper that they'll, or the game that they'll have been looking at on paper to say, okay, that's a win mm -hmm. and that's a win. Those are the games that could mm. really mean that there, you know, a tiebreaker happens or you get edged out of first or second position if you end up slipping up in these, you know, David and Goliath matches. And we know that Cloud9 actually understands the potential for this upset. I've talked to multiple Cloud9 members and they have legitimate fear of Kaboom and the upset potential because they know that Kaboom isn't coming into this with the mindset of having to go 4-2 or having to win the group. They're coming in with the mindset that if they win a game, the World Championship is, is a success for them. And that gives you a lot of freedom strategically and as far as risk taking goes that could very well play a spoiler for one of these favored teams. Well, it doesn't look like too many risks as of yet. They want to make sure, as we heard the analyst desk say, a strong laning phase, not thinking that Cloud9 would let up in any one of those lanes. So it's up to Kaboom really to get at least an advantage in one of those lanes that could carry, hopefully, 10 owns. And you can see right here, Cloud9 
playing no different against Kaboom than they would against other opponents, much like they do in the North American playoffs, much like they did against Alliance. They are doing the AD carry in the top lane to neutralize the landing phase and get Sneaky some free farm. You can see that Lep is headed up in that general direction. Lemonation just going to force him away completely. Says, right, shield on myself. Do that extra damage. Danz is going to come up to join Lep. So that will leave us with the 2v2 on that top side. And also means, of course, that there's a bit of free farm down the bottom lane for Minerva on Lucian. I wonder if that free farm is going to turn into a fast push. The freeze has been broken for him. He can't turn this into an extended 1v0 without getting some turret damage down. And it will actually mean that Balls can pivot down to that bottom lane very easily and pick up a bunch of farm. Well, he knows, we know Balls loves to just stay in lane and keep himself safe until he can make a huge impact on it. Clicked on that CS, I saw it, he stopped halfway. <laughs> this is Kaboom not playing the swap properly. It's something that requires a lot of practice. You have to be able to get good reads early on. You have to play wards early on in the game. But the fact that Minerva was in a lane all by himself without support help, and he did not set up a proper freeze, means Balls can very easily go in there and get far. Oh, Meteor's actually connecting with the Q there onto Danagon. They're both double buff. Where are the mid lane? Is Danagon actually going deep onto Meteor's? Couldn't quite get that knock up, and now High trying to turn this one around. He's going to get a lot of damage off. Who's he going for? But the Ignite towards Danagon. He wants those double buffs, and Danagon flashes to the safety of the brush. If Danagon did not flash at that exact moment, High had the point blank knock up on it, and it would have been the double buff. So High, despite burning his ignite, there definitely pressures Danny Gorn, and it should give Meteos a leg up. Playing the flow very nicely, gets in for more damage. Ten owns. We saw this between Cool earlier as well. Shao Wei Shao. He was taking a bit of damage, but Shao Wei Shao was able to play that Syndra very strong. So Ten owns with the damage he's taken, still in a good position here. 17 to 21, not too bad on CS. As High tries to keep it aggressive. So, after the first few waves in that mid lane, there is going to be high that has a slight advantage. The AD carries actually sneaky with that 2 on 2 pressure that is edging ahead of that of Minerva, who, of course, is now in a full on 1 on 1 versus Balls. And there's a good amount of damage here coming out from Balls. He needs to be careful here as Danagon comes down. And, well, red like a book, really. Balls has gone back toward the tribush. Yeah. But will he realize that Danagon's in there? He's got good range. No flash to go even further, though. It was a choose-your-own-adventure, and he definitely chose the wrong one in that path. He does not have the ward in the right spot. But Danagorn is really waiting on this one, maybe for the last burst of mana to come out of balls here, or maybe that room. He's hoping for the rune prison. That's exactly it. They just don't bother waiting any longer, and it means balls was not trapped in any cast animation, so he could easily flash the flag combo. So, the flash down. We'll see if Danagorn can keep the aggression up from lane to lane. Means that Meteor's that entire time though farming the top side of his jungle. He's almost approaching a 10 CS lead and he's gonna keep that trend going as he heads onto the bottom side and towards his own race as Lep doing some good damage there towards Lemonation. The hook coming out! Max Range landing onto Sneaky, not followed through, the flay does come in and a bit of pressure there in that 2v2. A little bit of miscommunication. That was the ward coming in from Lep. Dance didn't think he was gonna hit that one possibly either, but it's gonna rass and they keep it strong in this lane. And we've seen this through a lot of the teams that end up near the bottom of these groups of worlds. The laning phase is usually quite close. We've actually yet to see a laning phase twist in the favor of the underdog. If that happened, I'd be fascinated to seeing how that progresses on the game because as of now, if the lane is close, the better team will play off better, but that's another hook. That could be a kill. All the shields in defense right now. Lemonation low on mana. The ignite goes down. It's high flashing in. Oh, he dashes through him. The exhaust is down. Can he still keep it? One last Q. High to pick up first. Oh, oh, no. No. What a play from Dan to save left more than one. <laughs> also gets the grab, but there's nobody there to pick up on it. Great play from the support of Kaboom. And the amount of pressure lost by that monstrous roam up top from high is going to buy so much time for Tin Owens in this mid lane to pull ahead of high. You can see there the farm 50 to 37. Tin Owens doing a good job. We'll also get some minion damage onto that turret. So not all bad here for Kaboom. Minerva continues to farm, has now pulled ahead because of the fact that 
Sneaky and Lemon Nation had to back away from that top lane. Should be able to push it straight through onto the turret. Meanwhile, Lep will use his teleport to get up there on that top lane and get a decent wave of farm as well. A really nice chunk there. Thought they were going to miss it, but the teleport was still up. Fiendish Codex buys for both Tindones and Lep on their first backs to keep themselves a bit more powerful in lane. Nerva safely backing, Dan's on the roam everywhere right now, trying to keep the wards up, trying to keep Medios out of some dangerous positions that could really put Kaboom behind here. Seven and a half minutes in, really great back and forth so far from both teams. Still feel that Kaboom, despite having his good early lane phase, have to make plays, have to have a bigger lead going through into the phase of the game where Cloud9 yeah. are going to be stronger than them. What? Uh, we've, we've seen surprises already. I don't think anyone expected AHQ to pull out that win against EDG last week, uh, last week in Taipei. We'll see if Kaboom can do that here over Cloud9. Of course, sit 1-0 and zero in the group after that great victory against Alliance earlier on today. You can see me just here doing his red buff, and we'll see if that means then a visit towards this mid lane. I don't think the bottom's much of a question. Actually, push quite far out as Minerva having a good little trade there with Sneaky. He's got the level advantage in that bottom lane, and he's trying to bully that weak mid game from Trist. Sneaky has not actually respected the 2v2 lane matchup in the slightest with this item build. He's won an Avarice Blade first. You'll actually often see a Trist build an early pickaxe and then go into a static shift, so the pickaxe gives him some type of trading potential in lane. He's basically doing nothing in that lane uh, right now, so they're playing victim to Kaboom's superior laning phase at the moment. Very surprised they're taking trades here. BF Lucian to this, that gold generation. It's not going to work out too well for Sneaky, but the shields are coming in big from Lemon Nation. Medios and High trying to get in. Great ward here coming in from Kaboom already in the death brush. They'll see this pink ward. Nah, possibly not. Don't take the time oh, to take that. Looks like they're going to try to work something off of this. Danagorn, I love it. He sees something and he wants to try and make a playoff. Trying to force that bottom lane all the way through onto Sneaky's tower here as well. Lemon Nation already leaving the lane to get a ward inside of the river and make sure that Kaboom don't just go straight in there for that dragon. But with this lane pushing up, there is definitely a possibility of that happening. However, Meteor's on the bottom side just in case a dive comes in. We see Dan and Gorn and Tin Owens entering the jungle, but this is maybe not where they want to be. Come up behind high. He's already got himself in a safe position. Great job in base, though. Nobody's here. And I want to stand right in the mid. Yeah, based on the positioning of Meteos, setting up for all these counter ganks, even the itemization of Sneaky, it's almost as if they were expecting Kaboom to just lose their minds and do these really crazy, aggressive, high risk plays, because that's what all of us were expecting from Kaboom. But what Kaboom is doing is they're just playing standard, strong lanes with solid vision control because Cloud9 has postured themselves so defensively, they're having to give up a lot of stuff to Kaboom. This dragon's gonna be an attempted steal. And as long as they wait it out, Medios won't be able to make it in. Oh no! Stolen away there. Medios is gonna pay the price though. We'll go down for first blood. But getting in there nicely. I'm quite surprised that after that ward actually went down that someone didn't move to the back to try and block that Q from coming through. But it was a smite, of course, from Meteos that got them that pick up on the dragon. It leaves Cloud9 after all that said and done. A thousand, uh, not a thousand, not quite that much just yet. A hundred or so gold in the lead here over Kaboom. Ten and a half minutes in and that bottom lane once again going to be starting to push out as Lep and Balls going head to head and Lep losing far too much health there. He needs to be careful, although Balls is a decently low HP. Yeah, the late game scaling of Cloud9 he is vastly superior, Rise plus Trist and the disengage from Janna. But with that being said, this early pressure and mid-game potential from Kaboom is pretty great. We'll see what Tinones can do with this double buff on Cinder because he's he's out CS high by a pretty big margin. Some of that's from the roam that hide at top lane, some of that's now that he has the double buffs, but it's Tinones' it's time to shine. And we also have Minerva, 95 to 72 on Sneaky, so they're taking hold when they need to with the damage, putting it in their belts as well. That pickaxe coming in onto Minerva, helping him trade with Sneaky in the bottom lane. Really, we've seen the shield be defensive for Sneaky, not really trade-oriented here. Dan's and Minerva continuously. Little poke plays. You get seen out by the ward. A little off on his uh, sweeper. There. Not a problem. Pink ward going down, and that will mean that Jarvan can come through for that lane gang. They need to clear out those minions though because they will have vision on the top side of that brush and
may even give things away if they just try and fast push. That one sneaky actually going out with his ultimate. There's the hook coming in. Goes wide. Lemon Nation will flash away from the flag and drag of Danagorn and nicely avoided from Cloud9. Yeah, that was some pretty swift play there by Lemon Nation. If any of those spells landed, he was dead to rights. But he burns Flash, does not even have to burn his ultimate, and he escapes that gank unscathed. Sneaky using his ult on that. Seems like he'll feel safe in lane still with Lemon. They get that pink word cleared out of their forward brush, and they were able to regain control. Some kind of damage they could put on this. Oh, a little bit of miscommunication. Didn't take the minion out first, but they still pick up a safe lane here. And maybe a roam from 10 Ounce. Looks like they want to get inside the jungle. They don't have too much vision on it, but they do see Meteos here and there. They want to make sure he's not making any of the plays. A lot of aggression coming in. Cloud9 Whoa. collapses towards the top of Dragon, but nothing comes of it. Yeah, and a very quick flash by Tino. He knew that he was out of position, and he immediately had to retreat. But with that collapse from the Cloud9 bottom lane, it does expose the bottom lane itself to being taken down. Oh, I think, yeah, left me off a little more than he can chew. That has to use the wild growth. How to go back up walls. It will just pop straight through those pots, get himself healthy once again. Meanwhile, the bottom lane, he's still pushing here. Minerva might have gone a little bit too far into the bait. Gives a blast back. We did have Thanagon waiting inside of the brush, but Medios and High both coming around. The point blank Q actually missing there, and Danagon will just slide over the wall to freedom. Nice grab. The box is down. Lemon's caught the Cataclysm. Heal comes out from Sneaky, so they are still with, well within staying in this fight. It's going to be Minerva going down. That's the 80 carry DPS out of the fight. The teleport comes in as well. They're going to know it's be stopped in the top lane actually it was left with enough mana but does he bring in a fight that he does not want the spell flux able to come out and take him down and just like that cloud nine gets three for zero it took him 13 and a half minutes to set up a play but they were able to find one right there the collapse down from the mid lane worked this time for high and they just clean up from top to bottom almost a thousand gold lead here with two minutes until that dragon comes up. Let's have another look at that one in the top lane. Balls 1v1 stop from TP and says, okay, then I'll kill you instead. Yeah, I think that was just one of those situations where Balls knew he was already in a favorable position in lane, so he didn't care if the teleport got interrupted. If he gets to teleport down bottom lane, he gets a kill. If Lulu's gonna dare to interrupt him, he'll just kill Lulu. So it was a smart, heady play by Balls, and he gets a kill anyway. Minute and 30 coming in on Dragon. Looks like they will be able to lock down a bit of vision, but Kaboom has the same thing in mind. Coming out with a few pink wards. Gonna be able to help this out more with sweepers. The orb already grabbed from Nerva. Definitely doesn't want to be caught out in these occasions. Credit as well to Kaboom at this point. If you look at the minimap, the bottom side of Cloud9 jungle is pretty much all warded up. There's a pink ward in the side of the red buff and one in the tri-bush there for Cloud9, but still a couple of deep wards out of Kaboom. They don't have one in this top lane, though, which could be a problem if they decide to dive on through. Lev will try and speed himself up. The Q will land. He's going to go in front of him. Wild growth is used from Lev. They get his ultimate and might just be able to finish the tower now. Yeah, but in the meanwhile, Kaboom is pushing down that mid lane using that attack speed from Jarvin. They're answering most of Cloud9's moves pretty well. Well, a little too far behind, not a few, but not all. And such a great early game here. They said the lanes couldn't or wouldn't be one on the analyst desk, but Kaboom's doing everything they can to keep pressure onto Cloud9. We've seen, as you said, Cloud9 play that safe game, no matter who they're up against. It seems like Kaboom has found that as a way where they can get under their skin. Cloud9 is playing remarkably safe in this one as well. I'm yeah. actually very surprised that Sneaky decided to go straight for the Static Shiv instead of stopping in the middle for a pickaxe so he'd at least have some type of trading against Minerva. Now with the static ship, he can be respectable in this next dragon fight, if that's what it comes to. Well, it looks like he will. The dragon just pulled out of his pit. Meanwhile, Lep is going to be having to go on this top turret. He does have teleport available to him if he's going to come down. Minerva will use an early call in there. They pulled him balls and half decent damage done to him. There is a TP coming on top, but he's got no HP left. He comes in with nothing and Cloud9 just kill him off. Bit of a whoopsie. Not a good TP. Not in the slightest left. It probably seemed so good in his head. 
but he just was not in sync with the rest of the team. Danny Gordon was not initiated, and he had no stun follow-up. He just gets blown up. I think Kobe would say something about that. But moving on, That's, four, uh, four to uh, one. 17 minutes on the clock, and a 3,000 gold lead is what Cloud9 is looking at right now. They were actually, it's kind of like a mouse trap. They were kind of leading Kaboom into where they wanted and when they wanted the fight. They warded up perfectly, and they bit as soon as they were able to. Two to one in turrets, Kaboom still has a bit of map pressure on that front, but is it going to be enough to carry them through this mid part of the game? The Rod of Age is already charging. We see a few core items built up on high and sneaky with the static ships here, and they're not afraid to start making plays. Feel is fairly reminiscent of the Alliance game, right? Play it safe, yeah. slowly but yeah. surely get yourself a lead, and well, if you look down their team comp, that suits them fine. Yes, maybe they're not gonna flash you win up in 20 minutes over Kaboom, right. but that's not really what counts at the end of the day. Let once again may be in trouble. That top turret is very low. Actually, Balls pulls the aggro early on. Let uses an early wild growth, and now Danza's coming in as well with the threat. What can he do? Whoa! Oh, 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 kick there into both of his teammates, and that should be the end of that one. Not what? the easiest thing to do. An escape right there. Just get the geometry just right to knock all three of them up. Because math. Hey, right there, maybe Kaboom gets a turret on the back side, but Cloud9 is going to get mid lane and bottom lane out of this. There's another one. Outer three are dropped. They can start to easily move into Cloud9's uh -oh. jungle, but wait a minute. Sneaky's trying to easily move into a little bit of Minerva's personal bubble. Takes him down. He'll be out of the game for a little bit here. High trying to take it out with 10 owns. He wants a blue buff, but it doesn't look like he's going to get it. 10 owns says, get off of my turret right now. Trade a kill, and he may not go down. Oh. No, he's gonna go down. The last kick hits, and that's a shutdown, actually, on the Tino. Hi was playing a very dangerous game, dancing around a turret there in the face of a DFG Syndra. The DFG active didn't actually get used by Tino's there, so a little bit of a misplay. Luckily for Hi, he still picked up the kill, despite getting a little bit nuts. And I think why not trying to look in there? Maybe something risky here to just edge him out. Speaking of edgy now, we've seen balls just bring that farm back in the top lane. Of course, Saturn 1-0-0 after that solo kill onto Lep just a little bit earlier on. And had that tier stacking up for a good while now, and he's going to be picking up that Archangels pretty soon. And that's that fight once again in mid, and you see that Tinon's actually lost vision of high there for a moment. Yeah, well, he hit him with the ultimate real easy. The wind wall blocked so much, but then high ran out of his duration. Of course, Tinon's is just going to alt his face at that point. Uh, he figured he'd get a one-for-one -one trade. That's the best he could get once his wind wall had fallen. Not really sure what High's play there outside of hoping to trade a kill. Nobody gets a blue buff. <laughs> well, he's got it back anyways as he comes back yes. in the lane. And no one's still happy with that situation. 20 minutes on the clock, and it looks like Cloud9 starts to gather in the mid lane as they want to start cracking down on this pressure. That mid turret, on 5% HP left. They have a little bit of work to do, but the whole team of Kaboom says, not this one, not right now. A couple of wards cleared out, the whole coming through from Dan. They had vision of that one thanks to the ward over the side. The Q lands, but no follow, but there's the knock up onto Tino's high. Gonna go in for this one. He himself will get next knocked up, but Sneaky coming around the side as well. Dan and Gordon will throw down his cataclysm, but Sneaky just knocks him back through the back wall, and that is a two for zero. This tower is going down now. That was some exquisite Yasuo play right into the wind wall, flew that Cinder ultimate, and that is how you play the matchup. High destroying right there for 10 owns and the rest of Cloud9 following up just right. And there was one person missing from that as well. This guy in the top lane still pushing by himself. The split push working out quite well, and with how big High is getting, they probably be able to do this in every lane quite soon to start spreading Kaboom's thin. Now, and of course, Rai's not going to be taking those turrets down very quickly, but if you get that entire time all on your own, you're still going to take chunks out of the turrets. The rest of the team come through, and that will be at 21 minutes into the game. Well, we're closing in to a 10,000 gold lead at this point. Eight two up in kills, two with the AD carry, three in the mid lane. Spread really nicely across the entire board. And this is that knock-up and ultimate from Yasuo again onto Tino. Yeah, the impressive thing to me wasn't the initiation, it was that win wall. At the very moment when he spread between Tino, he's like, okay, now is the time we'll try to retaliate. Let's make that an impossible feat. So he throws out the win wall, Cinder can't fight back, High takes almost no damage, and they get two kills.
something you can't take away from Kaboom, the strong individual play. But you see the separation when it gets to the team fights, the coordination that the teams outside of their realm of play just start bringing to the table. It's too much for them to handle. Kaboom's trying to set something up here, but can they pull it off? And then Cloud9 just push the minion way through and say, nah. You're going to be hiding around that corner. Let's not fight that one. Ward goes over the top and that will spot pretty much the entire Kaboom team just waiting over the side. Just half a minute until the next Dragon comes into play. Cloud9 already set up nicely, clearing out those wards as they come down. And there is the Q actually landing towards Lucian, but he's high that's going on to Danagorn here in the middle. And he's taken a lot of damage already. A late wild growth will save him, but that pretty much just guarantees the Dragon now. Yeah, Cloud9 still playing a, to a level of safety and caution, but they're turning up their aggression ever so slightly the larger their lead grows. This is only 22 minutes in, but they have assumed control. With the safety we've seen lately from Medios, the rest of the team, it's really been high, the one to start going in hard on these fights. Yasuo allows them to do that a little bit stronger. They're gonna go ahead and pick up another dragon within this game, all of them for that fact. It looks like they are happy to head back right now, take their time, get back into this one. Great warding all around right now. Pink wards are already out. We'll probably see Cloud9 start to move those up as they disappear from their side of the map. 23 minutes in right now, eight to two. Seems like they started to pretty much just clamp down. And balls might even feel comfortable enough to go full on into Minerva at this point. That Archangel Rod of Ages. And not often we see Rise being able to split push so effectively, but certainly pulling it off this game. Kaboom, you know, able to really answer him this far up into the game. You see the wards on the bottom side of Kaboom's jungle put down by Cloud9. They're even going to be clearing out now over towards the Dragon side. And they've sent Minerva to try and deal on that bottom side of the map with balls, but well, if he's then pushed away from the tower, he can just TP over towards the Baron or wherever else Cloud9 might be pushing. Cloud9 really holds all the cards in this matchup, and it just, oh, means they can catch people in the jungle. Big hit on the dance, throws down the box, the disengage, but they know they have what they want. This is almost exactly what happened in their fight earlier. They, not a kill's gonna come out of this, but all the pressure that they need to make something happen well. Yeah, I mean, they get people so low here, they're, thinking they could just do the Baron. They were expecting Kaboom to try and check, but when they realized how cautious they were, they're just gonna start dealing with two men. That is a Scrying Orb, though, that will spot them. Minerva's pickup. Waiting off to the side. Actually, Stun comes in onto Balls here, but sneaky off to the side, able to put some damage back. Dan's even stepping forward there, maybe looking for a hook, but Cloud9 already backed away from that one. You feel like this game really teetering on a knife edge here where Cloud9 is to get that chance to just nip over and finish off the Baron before Kaboom can actually get in there quick enough to screen up a vital pickup at this stage because they just can't keep up with the vision war on that side of the map. No, they're falling so far behind. And one thing that happens when you do Force Sweeper and a Scrying Orb as well is because you're dropping off trinkets, you actually just have to place more purchase wards. They have the double side stone, which should aid in that, but it's just not necessarily keeping up with what Cloud9 is doing. Dancor uses everything to get in. Uh -huh. That's a pretty headstrong clear he's got himself going into there. And it's going to be, oh, the Lancer gets stopped, but he is able to put his left foot out and do the hokey pokey. Gets out on that, and he gets himself to safety. 26 minutes coming up on the clock. It's looking grim for this Baron for it. Boom. It looks like Cloud9 wants to throw themselves into this. Just face check and brush right now. You can see how confident Balls is, how far ahead he is right now. Level 14, and it's just about the highest in the game besides zero. You know, it's actually just recalling now. There's a wind wall coming down. We'll stop most of the culling. Leaves Minion still alive underneath the tower, and Cloud9 just walking in for that one. We'll take another inner turret. Leaves just the base left alive now for Kaboom. That 10,000 gold lead is just moments away you feel for Cloud9. He's left spotted by Meteos. And if you look at the minimap as well, it's, it's pretty much all blue at this stage. Only really got that scrying off to work with, which is going to be coming off cooldown. And we'll probably 
get forced into being used in just a moment. Meteor's actually waiting off to the side here. This is if he can get in for a cheeky little pick. Cloud9 definitely not letting off the gas here. Kaboom is hoping to get some type of pick with that Deathfire Grasp onto Tinones. Just one kill to hopefully create more of an advantage, but it's the other way around here. Cloud9 is definitely the ones dictating because you don't actually get catches without vision control. That's where it all begins. Cloud9 holds all that. And it's hard. You have High initiating as well with the Guardian Angel, their catches. Got to be for naught if they use everything on to him, and High can really force that to happen. Goes into the minions. He's going to get his cues here. Might just initiate his own fight, but they are using this to push the team back left just on the outside. High is behind his wind wall there. They managed to catch out down and go, and he will go down. There's a three man ultimate coming out from High. Good stun back though. Guardian Angel will bring by high, uh, high back to life. The hook comes oh. through. Actually hits Lemon Nation. I don't think that was the intended target. He was trying to time High's regen, and that will be one man down on either side. Hey, they got a kill, still counts. But now Cloud9 is trying to push on. Sneaky is a monster. Oh, Sneaky indeed tearing through the base by himself. Looking for left. Gets his reset to jump out of this one. Lep's doing everything he can. Oh. He just wants a kill. Whimsy speed up. Will he be able to lock it down? Meteo says, eat my foot. And he's going to be out of this one. Minute left on to Dragon. That's not Baron. And it looks like they may actually just decide to walk this one out. Dragon can go to Kaboom. Cloud9 knows what they want the rest of this game. Yeah, nice stun there by Tenones to prevent that dive from becoming more painful. Obviously, High landed a pretty good stun there. And a cool little thing before that fight, uh, Cloud9 had all five pink wards down on the map. Every single individual had a pink ward yeah. that was unkilled. And Kaboom had zero of their own. But they've since pushed out, gotten one of their own down, and they're trying desperately to clear a few of Cloud9s. Well, the utilizer time didn't even need to scan that. Oh. Check out if any green wards are down. And I go and get another pink taken away. And some vision of his own in the back of that Baron pit. Well, Cloud9 did go back. And of course, shop up from this no, one. Baron. No, I'm not sure that's Baron. So he walks down and go and really needs oh. it. They, they're going to take a lot of damage from this one and actually has to wait for his flag to come up to get out of the pit. Disaster. A little bit of a whoopsie there. They're able to get him out safely, but that means their jungler is very hurt for something that Cloud9 has wanted to do yeah. for a while now, and that's Baron. They're still going to proceed with extreme caution, however. <laughs> the only way Cloud9 loses this game to Kaboom is through a miraculous Baron steal or a Baron fight gone wrong, so they're going to control their expectations. They know they have six turrets down. They're going to make sure they have vision containment, and then they would go for Baron. With 30 minutes on the clock, Cloud9 has a 10,000 gold lead, one of the biggest they've had here coming in. But they're two games. But it is meaning that they know to put their foot down, like you said, Jack, keeping that pedal to the metal, and now attempting the Baron Lemonation on the outside for a full amount of disengage. And there it is. Oh, Meteos over the wall. I thought that was going to be high as well. He gets himself back in with a safeguard, easily taken on Baron. Lemon's forced to flash. Balls now it takes the defense on trying to stop them from getting into Baron. Really slick Lee Sin play there by Medio, jumping out to kick Danagorn away and then just flying back inside the pit because Lee Sin. And then Lemon Nation aided a little bit as well to blow him back away. Danagorn had no way of getting into the pit. Keeping them completely under control here. Cloud9 looking to make zero mistakes on their way to another victory and currently have a massive gold lead. We've just gone past the half an hour mark in this one. And Boom really looking to just find anything in this game that could give them a glimmer of hope at this point. Yeah, and honestly, a Cloud9 victory here would actually mean that North America goes 4-0 on the first day of this first stage. LMQ went 2-0, Cloud9 went 2-0. Now remember, they have yet to face the Korean teams in both of the groups, so this will definitely kind of set the stage for some Pretty big clashes, uh, heavy favored Korean teams versus LMQ definitely not expected to go 2-0 today. But early showings is a strong show for North America here in these groups. A lot of momentum that they would need as the fans consider it to go against those teams. And right now they're using all that momentum to just take out each member of Kaboom methodically. Surgically removing him from the map now, looking at the middle inhibitor turret as trying to engage over the wall. I wouldn't put it past Sneaky to be the first one hopping in. Well, they 
gonna wait at least for now for that next minion wave to come around. You can see Meteor stepping forward high. Will also get up in Kaboom's face as well. They take that inhibitor without any push back from Kaboom. The inhibitor itself will go down. And to be honest, Minerva's still down for 15 seconds here. I mean, if Cloud9 can get the right kind of fight, I don't know why they wouldn't continue to push on, aside from it being a little bit too risky. Not many minions to be working with right now for Cloud9, but they are definitely staying in that risky position. Midwave is just on the front step of Kaboom's base, and they have everything in HP in Baron buff and stats that they need to continue this fight. The next wave coming in, they're going to basically force Kaboom into doing something aggressive. Windball, this is just like an inhibitor turret at this point, except behind it is a Nexus. There is the second Nexus sorry, going down as well. Kaboom got no defense left alive. I'm going to jump straight in there onto Tino. Get one kill, but they're focusing the Nexus down. And Cloud9 going to be picking up their second victory of the day. Couple of kills still left to be had here at the end, but they will finish it off. And a convincing win once again for Cloud9. And just like that, it was over. What seemed like a very slow start from Cloud9, potentially a little scary when Kaboom started getting some niceness in the lanes. Cloud9 kind of turned it on. They knew they had the strong mid game. They had the Janna for the... They knew they had the strong late game. They had the Janna for the mid game. And they definitely had the strategic advantage and the confidence to close this one off right. Able to stave off a bit of that Danagorn aggression from lane to lane on the Jarvan. Pretty much banned out a few of the junglers he would like to use this game. Boom, doing what they can in the laning phase, but it seems that teams find them in the fight phase and are able to pick apart the mistakes. Yeah, and I feel like we've almost repeated this story quite a few times because we saw a similar thing last week as well in Taipei that the you know underdog teams did well in the laning phase, and I guess that's kind of the the fundamentals that you learn from playing League of Legends right at the start, you learn to have a good laning phase first of all. And then, you know, they're falling apart when it comes to the more team-oriented plays. We saw Cloud9, they, they made literally no mistakes in that one. Maybe yeah. here and there slightly too deep, but playing everything really by the book. And you're saying we use this to practice turning a, an early game good start into an actual victory. It's one of the reasons I actually like the World Championship in this sense, because we see players at different stages of competitive competitiveness. We just get to see the strategic depth of League of Legends, because you know how good these guys are in lane. Mechanically, individually, they're all fairly good, but it really just comes down to the team play, and it's not even close in how these games go out. There is a super low percent chance that some of these teams can take down the greater teams, and it's just... You never see this type of difference. The monstrous, di I can't find the words for it. The monstrous differences in skill uh, at the World Championship. Well, it's definitely been shown here quite a bit today. Teams doing all the homework that they, you'll find it. Don't worry yeah, about it. Eventually. <laughs> Teams doing all the homework that they need to. And like you said, NA coming out very strong is a lot of people put them kind of to the wayside, but we haven't seen them play who everybody wants them to play, and that's the Koreans. Yeah, both those games will happen tomorrow. As the European guy, I'll just stay quiet here on the end <laughs> of the table. Not the greatest start for Europe, that is for sure. But of course, we are going to head back over to Quick Shot and the analyst says for more on that Cloud9 win. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm sitting in the analyst desk in LA, and I'm happy to support North American teams. Uh, Cloud9, once again, playing very, very well. Uh, I think I want to talk about Kaboom. Their lane swap, questionable. Jet touched on it. Uh, Krepa, I would like you to expand. But I think Dan's was an incredible thresh. And toe-to-toe, -to -toe, yes, Kaboom had stronger lanes. They they bullied Cloud9 around for the first 10 or 12 minutes. Yeah, I think Cloud9 kind of played this with a little disrespect. Early game going double Avarice play when you already have like a triple hyper carry comp into what is arguably like really strong laners. Then they definitely threw um, Kaboom off guard because when the lane swap happened initially, Lucian immediately pushed in wave one under the, into the tower because he was too late to freeze that. But then he pushed a second wave into the tower. He didn't start freezing. Balls came into the lane, got half away for free XP. Freeze like, started stacking up. Balls got way more. And then even in the top lane, um, the Lulu Thresh combination from Kaboom was actually beating Sneaky and Lemon in lane. So imagine if, if Minerva would have played that freeze out properly, Balls could have stayed under level and they could have actually exploited their, their early game advantage. But even though Cloud9 went sloppy mode and went double average blade, they still won that game, so... I, I do fear a little bit for Sneaky, honestly. Like, I was hyping him up as a, he, a very improved player towards the end of the split, but uh, I know that when I was talking to Cloud9 near playoffs, they said, we lane swap every game because we're not sure of our bottom lane 2v2. 
they need to kind of step up a little bit. So they lane swap every game. And they've done so two times so far. Both their games so far at Worlds as well. And in this game, you saw Sneaky go 40 CS down in a matchup where Trist is arguably a 50-50 matchup in Dilution. What? So <laughs> it is. And and it's just it's mind-blowing because... It's because he built average plate, though. Yeah, the build was wrong, I agree. But you should not be 40 CS down. Especially, no offense to Minerva, but he doesn't have very much competition. Sneaky has so much good AD carry competition in North America, it shouldn't go that way. I do want to quickly highlight one thing about Dan's in terms of the duo lane and maybe why the Sneaky was suffering in CS. Thresh has been picked five out of the six games today. Uh, three out of three in Group C, two out of three in Group D. I looked at the stats. In Group A... He was featured in all 13 games, including the tiebreaker. Banned four times, picked nine times. Group B, only one game out of 12. Now, I'm going to theorize the competitiveness of the group could correlate to the number of Thresh picks, but this is something to discuss another time. Freak, let's get back to the game. And uh, yeah, well, two things. So, so one, actually, I think there's actually a lot of good Brazilian AD carries. BRTT is a lot of guys out there who are actually very incredible. Um, Maybe not as good as you, Devlift. I know you're pretty much <laughs> the godsend to carry. But um, but as far as rest of it, I don't know you're referring to yourself as far as competition Just for kidding. Sneaky. But I, I know. I'm messing with you. But I think there actually are quite a number of good AD carries in Brazil. Um, okay. Second, though, uh, you're implying that TSM is worse than like Dark Passage or something. TSM, clearly the best team to ever exist in League of Legends. So I don't know why you're saying B wasn't competitive. But um, okay, yeah. But y you're right. It, the laning phase was so darn good for Kaboom. Again, 10 owns did great. We've now seen, uh, what, Syndra's be... More ridiculous, probably. I'm sure you're, you're loving seeing that. Uh, the landing phase is good. Cloud9, it's unfortunate for me to say this, but like they still look like the same team that played in North American regionals, where their early game is really weak, they wait for the team fights around, and they play this really, really passive game. And I hate seeing them on champions like Lee Sin, that are normally playmakers, but instead, he's just there to have a sight stone and wait for 30 minutes. And like you ban the Kha'Zix, which is the ideal jungler for the wait for 30 minutes jungle pattern. Cloud9 did do one really aggressive play that kind of turned the game in their favor, which is the one clip we do have that I want to kind of run through right now, if you don't mind uh, pulling it up right now. All right, that works so. for you, and it doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> so we like him more. Drops so nice. the mic, walks away. <laughs> so let's roll this clip right now, and we can see right now, uh, Medios just pushed Syndra kind of out of lane and kind of scared her. So right now, High is starting to move down, and... Cloud9 just saying, get him, get him, get him. We have an advantage right now. So they're trying to get on Jarvan, but you know Jarvan gets out. And Lemon does a super good bait right now. Gets hooked, and watch for the Monsoon coming out. Monsoon hits right into Yasuo ulti. And this is just perfect. Lemon's just on survival mode right now, and Hai is just there to clean up. At this point, Hai is the only one that has kill potential, kind of. And he gets in there, gets his kill. And watch how C9 doesn't back off. They follow high and keep right next to him because if they had left high, Cinder was going to be able to kill him. So I really like C9 coming together and like kind of protecting their shot caller from getting picked off at the end. And at the same time, the TP that came in was canceled on top lane and balls as well. If you cancel my TP, I'll just take your life and uh, simple kill top lane. That that single play just turned like all the advantage that yep. Boom had. All those good laning phases just got punished because you just gave three kills around the map against the double average play, triple hyper carry comp. Do want to give some props to Kaboom. I think they have shown up somewhat in their first two games. They've got four more to step it up. So with six games complete here in Singapore, let's actually check out those standings because I've got some more questions for this analyst desk once we get that up on screen. I want to start talking to you guys about the LCS team performances. It has been a great day for North American squads. Uh, not so much for the European teams, uh, both Alliance and Fnatic really Looking lost, I think, is the best way to say it. Cloud9 coming in here, doing what Cloud9 does. LMQ on the other side have really surprised everybody. A lot of players, actually, every single analyst, barring Crumbs, wrote them off against OMG. Crumbs did get it wrong against Fnatic, because he did say they were going to win, despite him not being here. You can't so prove that. Let's talk about the LC. I, I can, actually, because it's <laughs> written, <laughs> written down right here. CZ, I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but uh, there's the predictions for absolutely everybody. Uh, right. <laughs> now that I've proven it, let's talk about the teams. LMQ surprising us, EU disappointing us. Uh, double lift, start there. Uh, I think the biggest surprise for me, Cloud9's high. Winning lane against Froggen, not what I expected yeah. at all. Actually, Mani r ranked Froggen as the number one mid in the group, and I definitely didn't expect High to be able to out-CS him in that matchup. Um, I think it was Zareth versus Syndra. It's just ridiculous. And the biggest surprise, obviously, LMQ, Moore, and Xiaowei Xiao showing their super world class. Uh, we all wrote them off, except for Crumbs. 
God bless Shower yep. Show. I'll never <laughs> lose faith in you again. Probably. Please, please listen to the Shower Show. But yeah, uh, <laughs> going off of that, yeah, you look at Fragan and Peke, and EU's kind of brought up as their mid laners are amazing. And then look at NA coming in there, though. We're taking the good best mids back. Yep. To, well, Probably, are, I are you part of that conversation? Yeah. I Who are you I'm so, a, so, sorry. In a. North American LCS mids are good. Hey. Okay. Most oh. of the time. Too soon. Most of the time. <laughs> low blow, low blow. Crepo. Uh, yeah, all low blows aside. I just want to like point out like both of your teams teams seem to have a problem with like split push in general. Alliance didn't go far enough in the split push like angle. They just sent Wicked back too early. They didn't put any pressure on the sidelines with that kill. There was literally nobody on, on the enemy team that could stop the kill, yet they, they just couldn't make that happen. At the same time, Fnatic was having issues with their split push. They weren't sure, like, do do we want to protect the AD comp? Is our AD carry split pushing? It's almost like as if this wave was stacking up on the side, and they're like, okay, like if we just ignore it long enough, it'll disappear. <laughs> but eventually they had to send somebody, and then they lost all the vision control in return. So both your team's teams, both European teams rather, have uh, issues with silent control. Yeah, same, same thing even happened last week when we had Candy Panda on Vayne, who was like the key win condition, and thankfully for them, TSM screwed up and won the, won the game for SK anyway, but all the European teams have had trouble actually making yeah. split pushes work. Yeah, it's not something that has been super prolific towards the end of the summer split. Uh, EU as a region was doing very well earlier in the end last year, but definitely not towards the end. So we talked about the LCS squads. I do want to pick your guys' brains about the Korean teams that we did see, despite it only being, I think, one game uh, a piece for Najian. Shield as well as Samsung Blue. We're going to see them more tomorrow. As well as OMG. OMG didn't really impress me today, uh, maybe quite as much as I was expecting from them. Uh, Samsung Blue and Shield, on the other hand, I think living up to the levels. Shield Blue, do we see any weaknesses? Do we see the LCS teams being able to take games off of them? Double if they're well, excited. I just want to say that the LPL teams have really disappointed me. Uh, coming in, a lot of the analyst predictions was like, China might be the second best region, you know, by a pretty decent margin ahead of NA and EU. But honestly, EDG, Name was like a huge disappointment from Group A. And then in Group B, I feel like Starhorn Royal Club and TSM are pretty equal. You saw that the Starhorn Royal Club started slipping, TSM won the game. And if they had won against SK, I really think that TSM would have taken the first seed in Group B. So, and then finally, OMG, a really big disappointment. I just am not impressed with LPL teams. So we do actually have that graphic completed. So let's quickly pull that one up onto your screens and take a look at where these groups are shuffling themselves. Here we go, LMQ, surprising everybody, 2-0. and Samsung Blue with just that one game to their name. OMG, the surprises, 0-2. and two. Group D, it is, of course, Cloud9, 2-0. and Flashing White Shield, 1-1. We'll see more of those games tomorrow, but we'll keep this up as Crepo. You're going to share some more thoughts on some of the Asian squads that we're seeing. Yeah, just I, just in general, I feel I, I get a trend that Rumble is involved in a lot of these upset matches. Rumble seems to be the new pick that wasn't in the metagame uh, back back when the, all the playoffs were happening, so yeah. he's coming up on the scene. Thresh always come, shows up at these these world events come out because his kit is just so good at, um, at doing you know, what he does, you know, the CC and everything. So I'm wondering um, if the pick and ban patterns are going to change the next few days. I really think Rumble, yeah, you're right about that. It's like, you know, these LPL teams are team fight teams. And then Rumble is arguably the best top lane team fighter. I mean, what else do you have? You know, tanky tops like Lulu, Rise, like those don't compare to Rumble in a big team fight. Yeah, I agree. And I also kind of want to get back to the point that you were talking about double lift with Name, where uh, I remember back in the very, very beginning in the preview show for the very first day, we had an interview with the man and he said he's comfortable or he's confident because he's played against these AD carries. He understands them mm -hmm. and he's confident because he knows he can beat those guys up. Once we see EDG again, they're going to be against Starhorn Royal Club. He knows Uzi. I think we're going to see him come back to form. Again, this is his, Name's first international tournament. So he's only going to kind of grow from there. I think we will see specifically EDG, get better throughout the tournament. If I think they can win their quarterfinal, I think they can move on and start looking a lot more impressive. And maybe they will make that deep run we expected to them. They simply yeah. cannot afford to get any worse well, or sure. stay where they are at this point in time. All right, guys, thank you for the thoughts. It is time to stealth through the brush as we prepare to jump into the action with one of my favorite segments. It is one that we call... Ah! Thank you very much. Uh, first clip comes from Samsung Blue versus OMG, and this is Spirit grabbing first blood on Go Going, who was going nowhere. What like, was Go Going thinking here? Basic, I, very much, yeah. Oh god, it was. Um, he just didn't respect the level one Lee Sin Rumble chase down. He's so far away from his. But tower. you should notice, even if you've played against a Mundo before, like it's the exact same thing. Once you get hit by a cleaver, like you'll have to bring your flash. Now, Krepo, I know you like this play. It was Fnatic versus LMQ, and you know what, Fnatic. 
they saw LMQ and just thought, screw it, let's go ham. Yeah, I really think they, they capitalized really well here because they had the vision and they know what they're doing. That bubble really steals that. The Lulu Q comes in, the combo comes in from Jarvan EQ, and basically this guarantees three flashes. I think LMQ was in the right spot though, but they should have just sent two people bottom uh, to get that wave pushing out. But good reaction from Fnatic. Yeah, very good indeed. Next up was Cloud9 versus Kaboom. This was uh, a pretty good, I think we'll call it a no gank you. Beautiful kick from Leeson. I just love how Meteos starts scooting behind Thresh because he knows he's can, he can line up this kick. It wasn't a luck kind of thing. Yeah, one cool thing with Leeson as well is during the quarter second cast time, it roots the opponent. So you have a guaranteed trajectory that you're, you know he's going to go exactly this direction. You actually can't outplay it once it starts. And so he just knocks him down like bowling pins. Today I learned, and as Jet said, because Lee Sin. Uh, all right, guys, thank you very much. The excitement in the Singapore group stage continues tomorrow with a whole lot of pressure on the LCS teams as they're going to have to prove themselves. Alliance and Cloud9 will be doing battle with Najin White Shield. We will also see if Samsung Blue can, can live up to the hype as they take on Fnatic and LMQ. And then OMG and Kaboom will get a chance to bounce back from today's defeats. Those matches will begin tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central European Summertime, which is 2 a.m. Pacific. That does it for day one here in Singapore, but we do have three days of matches still yet to come as we head to the quarterfinals. In the meantime, I'd like to once again thank all of our special guest uh, analysts on the desk, as well as myself and the entire World Broadcast team. Thank you guys for watching. We will see you all tomorrow. Cloud Nine.